welcome to The Catholic Forge, a conversational podcast where we gather to explore our Catholic faith and discuss how it forms our lives. All are welcome to join in this conversation and journey. Thank you for listening. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. This is Eric in Missouri. This is Ben in Kentucky. And this is John in Illinois. Still in Illinois. Well, yeah, a little tongue twisted there too. <laughs> Well, for this episode, we'll be leaving the confines of our minds (laughs) and this, (laughs) I should have, I should have looked up uh, what Carl Sagan used to say at the beginning of Cosmos and ripped it off, but uh, we're talking about space travel. Yes, that final frontier uh, and whatever else. Kind (laughs) of, there's a lot, there's a lot here. (laughs) I mean, you know, uh, talking about economics uh, societal justice issues, apologetics, theology, uh, um, uh, in multiple facets. Fortunately, and thank you, Ben, for putting together some kind of some quick notes here, some ideas. And so, uh, if yeah. if you would kind of introduce this idea here, kinda, maybe get us started on uh, <laughs> on the first topic. Yeah, well, you know, I work in the science community, sure, and uh, so I think the people I work with being that I fell into the kind of that field, I'm not as science backgrounded as they are, but they, their ears really perk up anytime there's, you know, something new with NASA or whatever. I'm, you know, they get really excited. I'm always hearing about it at work. And I realized I didn't know a whole lot about it. So I was curious how long NASA has been around and just, you know, Googling it, looking into it quickly, found out that it was founded in 1958 Uh uh, while you know, Dwight D. Eisenhower was president and it was, it was a direct reaction to the Soviets having launched Sputnik one in 1957. Yeah. So the year before, and of course the cold war was going on. So it was kind of a tit for tat, you know, we can't be outdone by the Soviets. Uh, You know, whatever they can do, we can do better. And, you know, so NASA, they, they put a lot into into getting it up and running as quickly as possible. And, uh, I mean, there was already some exploration going on, you know, they are, it wasn't right. like they hadn't thought of space at all until then, but there's something beyond the planet. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> the Russians informed us. Yeah. So I don't, if you had asked me prior, I don't really know if I would have been, I feel like I would have been a little surprised by that year. I, I guess with the technological limitations, it couldn't have really been a thing much before that. Yeah. But I still, I guess my, my gut would have, would have felt like if I had had to guess like on a game show, I would have probably guessed earlier than 1958. But Yeah. I would put it in the World War II era, you know, a little pre-World War era, you know, kind of at least the investigation satellite stuff. We're getting into other kinds of communication come up on, on the wars there. So yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. 58. And that's quite a bit after the war too. Yeah. I don't know if, if you're aware, but recently these, all these documents were declassified and they flesh out this, ornate plan to build military bases on the moon Mm -hmm. uh that they i mean someone (laughs) some group of people in our government really thought we were going to be doing space combat with the russians and so we had to capture the moon for its strategic advantage obviously being able to launch you know uh uh well you wouldn't they wouldn't be intercontinental they would be extra planetary missiles <laughs> for, or whatever you know uh from the moon and any, anywhere on the planet mostly just russia and so you can if if you have you know an hour of free time get your google on and go find these blueprints and all the tractors they were going to i mean everything like how they were going to build housing units and oh my gosh they really believed that we were going to not only colonize the moon but have bases and laser guns like in Moonwalker or yeah. Moonraker, excuse me, and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I had heard that there was almost an international war when we first detected gamma ray bursts, I think it was, in mm. in space. They actually thought that's the Russians testing nuclear weapons on the far side of the moon. And then mm. they realized, I think it was something like supernovas or something like that, that it occurred, you know, millions of light years away. But sure, uh, sure. 
It says something, you know, uh, of that effect. Yeah, it, it was the whole Star Wars program. Wait a minute, no, that wasn't about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's something else. Well, yeah, and, right. and if you think about it too, the the pace that thing that technology was moving at back then. So you know, say you're a, a man or woman in the late fifties who's forty years old. How rapidly things had changed since you were just a child. You probably had every reason to believe, like, oh yeah, another ten years, we're we're living on the moon, like this this ball is rolling, you know. The yeah. Jetsons. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, they didn't know that. Of right. course, they they didn't know it was going to plateau a little bit once the initial discoveries, you know, kind of reached their limit for the time period, anyway. But yeah, it does sound kind of silly. If you want some great insight into that time, um, check out Hidden Figures. It's a movie. Uh, it's about NASA 1961. It, it, if you aren't big into science, but you want to watch a movie about the social climate in the early 60s, uh, it, it basically, I mean, with gross generalities, half segregation, half NASA. You know, we're looking at uh, the way that African Americans were treated inside of the NASA community and the advent of the mega computers coming in and taking over the math pools of human beings who crunched the calculations, you know, for the engineers. What's so neat is that you, you get to see the huge contributions that oh, uh, man. that African Americans at the time played in the development of NASA. Well, it, that movie focus is on on women too, right? Yeah, it's yeah. focused on yeah. women characters. Yeah, I haven't seen it, but I I remember the trailer. It's a worthy. It's something to give its humble. Mm-hmm. It's, it's very it's very yeah. delightful. Yeah, so it's in hidden figures, right? Like it, you, like everyone else, will be surprised to that you never knew these people existed, and that was that yeah. was sort of the idea. But that that whole time, um, wh- what an amazing time! It must have been such a thrill. Uh, well, I mean, I know there were issues, obviously remarkable issues, happening on the planet at that time as well. But the romance of of the unlimitless abilities of what could be accomplished. We will go to the moon by the end of this decade. Yeah, I mean, in in, in that sense of of galvanization, of a, a galvanizing of the national effort. This was a time when when uh, you know you could ask boys and girls, "What do you want to be when you grow up?" And they would tell you honestly from their heart, "I want to be an astrophysicist." You know. Or an engineer, or a mathematician, and what is it now? I want to study medieval literature. I, I want to. Be... I, that's what kids say. I want to be a professional video yeah. game player. Oh, absolutely, I, I've asked. <laughs> absolutely, and so, so and so, and what what an amazing time for the sciences in our country when there was such a national devotion. Of course, JFK's death also very much galvanizing that. You know, uh, almost you know locking it in place. Now we have to do it, and all this kind of stuff. In a, an and amazing did we time, really do it is the question. Oh, don't start with that. <laughs> but but uh, but uh, of course, I mean, you, you know where we're going to go with it is are these criticisms of it costs so much and we have all these problems on Earth and. But we know what air side Eric's on. I know. I'm just saying. I listen to that mocking tone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you've uh, unveiled no, all of your cards here before you said anything, Eric. Where is your poker face? I was cosplaying as the alarmist in 1961, but we have so many problems. <laughs> and, well, and where would we be? We wouldn't have microwave or Velcro. Actually, that that is not true. Velcro was made in the 40s in Sweden. So, uh, But no, no, I do no, have a list, true. John, of uh, of uh, things that NASA has given us, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Yeah, I want to I wanna hear your list because I – with you uh, laying your cards on the table, I'll lay mine. That I'm not one of those people. That your sure. your uh, impression there, but I am one of the. His voice isn't quite as high. I I, <laughs> I am one of yet. the. Uh, I won't even say remain to be convinced. I'm I'm more of the like. Okay, tell me a little more. Like I, I guess yeah, yeah remain yeah. to be yeah. convinced. Like I'm not against the space program by any means. I'm very interested. I love astronomy. I love everything I can learn about space that they, that they've discovered and given us, I find it fascinating, but, but in the back of my head, it's there of like, okay, how, how much is being spent on all this? Where's the money coming from? You know, yeah. is it robbing from other causes, you know, when it shouldn't be? So the, all those questions do roll through my head every time I hear pretty much every time I hear NASA, I'm like, okay, what's right. what's going on now? Right. And I know that Eric, I knew you were a big, mm-hmm. 
big <laughs> I was gonna say big space fan, big NASA fan. <laughs> Proponent, uh, sure. So yeah, I yeah, was yeah. curious to hear your take. Maybe you can educate me a little more on on the Velcro and Microwave. Well, let me let me let me steal your uh, thunder here because you put these numbers together, and thank you for doing that. Just as an example, uh, you, you, and I'm just trusting your research here, Ben, but I'm sure you're you are oh, it's re- solid. reputable. Yeah, <laughs> NASA's budget in 2019 coming up here will be 19.5 billion dollars. That's a lot of money. I mean, that's a lot of cheese. Uh, it's a lot of rice bowls that could be filled. If, absolutely. Uh, now, the the national budget, uh, I don't have the number for 2019, so I just did the laziest, quickest Google search I could, and I found the number from 2015, which the national budget for 2015 was $3.8 trillion. Of that, of that whole amount, $29.8 billion was given to, quote, science not just to nasa but let's presume that nasa received 15 billion dollars for their operating budget for that year in 2015 thus nasa was given one half of one percent of a 3.8 trillion dollar operating budget within our national system so just to put that in that context of it, they're not burning up all that much money, and if if you're gonna if you're gonna shout out the flagpole, there are other places you could go, uh, I, and I don't want to get down that road with this system or that system or defense or military. They're, that that's not really needed in this conversation. But just using the numbers given to us at the time, we see that NASA is is not blowing through you know mountains of money. Well, I find that to be a spurious argument. I think to say, look how grossly incompetent our government is at using our money. And so therefore, (laughs) this other giant chunk of money that they're using, $19.5 billion, is really nothing because they're so bad at spending the rest of our money. I I don't find that to be a convincing argument. Not that I'm saying that it isn't money worthwhile, but I find that to be a a bit of a a flawed argument. $19.5 billion could transform a lot of our current life yeah. presently feed a lot of oh. children do a lot of uh, good stuff here without well, and, a doubt. And, yeah, and and my argument is that nineteen point five isn't enough. You know, it it should be doubled or tripled or quadrupled, and let NASA really pick itself up from you know from the decline it has suffered. And and, and we can say justly that that she has paid in blood of uh, the cost of this this great expedition, this great exploration of our, you know, uh, uh, cosmic community, as it were. Uh, so you mentioned the things that, um, that NASA has, well, what, well, let me just say, every year uh, since 1976, NASA puts out a publication called The Spinoff, NASA Spinoff. And basically, it's a report. Oh, I thought it was their newest TV series coming no, on, no. on MTV. <laughs> no, no. What? MTV. No. Uh, uh, you can find them all. They're all online. You can go all the way back to 76, or you can, or the, the, this, this year's just came out. And basically, it shows you all the stuff that NASA did over the last year. Because, of course, NASA is is funded by taxpayer money. So it's sort of their way of saying to you, hey, thank you, and here's what we did with with your money. Uh, so the, just quickly, the, the things that NASA did not create or invent, um, Velcro, oh. which was a, uh, Teflon, Tang, can you believe it? Tang was developed <laughs> by General Foods in 57. Um, but it was used on space miss- mm-hmm. missions, which you know made it the thing. They didn't make the space pen or the smoke detector or all these things or the microchip. But here are some things. I'll try to go quickly. Uh, within the realm of health and medicine, infrared ear thermometers. You know, since you don't want to do it, you know, the other way or the other way. Uh, ventricular assistance devices, LASIK, artificial limbs, invisible braces, scratch-resistant lenses, which I appreciate a lot. Of course, the space blanket, which and that's a trifle, I know. Uh, and most importantly of all, 3D food printing, uh, which is self-explanatory. In, in the realm of transportation, of anti aircraft anti-icing systems, so those big uh, 
uh, silver strips you see on the wings of airplanes or yeah. you know automatic de-icers. Highway safety, improved radial tires, uh, uh, tires, chemical detections. Now, hold on, hold on. Sure. Maybe it's too late. Maybe I'm getting tired. No, it's okay. To my brain, 3D food printing is not self-explanatory. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> It, it, I mean, it's just like uh, printing something, anything in, in 3D using a, some kind of synthetic whatever art compound or whatever they use for 3D printing. So they they B Hex one of uh, partnered with NASA and they developed the system and it can print like uh, pizza and and desserts and stuff. And uh, um, oh, golly, was it on the space station? Is that where I heard about this? Um, but it began as a NASA funded project. So you can print food from nothing. I, ben, let me follow up with you on it later. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Kenner has also come out with the Easy Bake Oven. You mix up your little cakes and pies and you put it in there and there's a light bulb that heats it up and bakes it. It's phenomenal. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, uh, we're talking uh, landmine removal, fire resistant firefighting equipment. Um, temper foam, enriched baby food formula, the whole idea of freeze drying. Um, uh, 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 let's see, keeping on going. Environmental and agricultural resources, water pur- pur- purification, solar cells, pollution remediation. Not the whole GPS idea, but basically making it like a million percent better than it was before. Yeah, without satellites, it wouldn't work so well. Yeah, yeah, it's like, you know, it's kind of, it's handy. And GPS. so, uh, uh, um, <laughs> the S. <laughs> No, uh, that's enough. Um, yeah. and, and so a lot there that, and, and not like trifle things, um, you know, that we are like, oh, that's cool. Not things on the side, but actual industries that have come out of NASA. Now, th- what I would say without going into further study, not all of those things are directly related to the space program. And of course, na- that's not the only thing NASA does. I think there are like 76 different branches or departments of it. So it's not that's not all they do is sit around and, and off they go. I mean, there's like it's, it's a diverse, grand um, pursuit at NASA. Yeah. But just to answer your question, those are some things that have come out of it, which are obviously beneficial to us. If I had to guess, I mean, and this is not research, but if I had to guess, I mean, they're still very much tied in with the Defense Department, I would imagine. I mean, I'm, a large portion of what they do is probably in coordination with national defense in some way or another, but I don't know. I, I could not answer yes or no. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, the question... Well, the, the, our, the criticism, I think, is really just of wouldn't that money be better spent here? Well, you said it yourself, Ben, in the pre-show that is, if we're talking in, like on a national level, the U.S. gives more to aid, period, than any other country that is. Yeah, and did you did you share that number? No, he did not, but that's worthy to note. John, uh, John, do we, you have that? Is it $50 billion? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, let's, let's make it $200 billion. <laughs> I, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, so... You know, for yeah. the the skeptics or the remaining to be convinced, like myself, I mean that is an important fact that you know if we're spending nineteen and a half billion on NASA and space exploration, that we did have our priorities somewhat straight, and that we we gave fifty billion to foreign aid um, on a, and that that number varies depending on the year, but it seemed I previewed a few years recently, yeah. few recent years, and it seemed to always hit around fifty billion in foreign aid, so. I mean, we yeah. are we are doing more on the ground than in the stars, so to speak. But yeah, and, and you know, I don't know that these two points are necessarily contrary to one another. You know, one the fifty billion is a is a direct contribution to the world now, and of course, what NASA is doing is a contribution in in exploration, in development of new things that are going to better humanity in the long run. And so, if it's um, you know, it still is an investment in the human person, just in a different level. Yeah. So I don't know that they necessarily need to be in opposition to one another. So you both can get along. Yeah. And if I were to stir the pot even more, you could bring some economist in that would say the 50 billion and the 19 and a half billion aren't yours to spend in the first place. You're in debt up to your eyeballs. <laughs> well, th- that is that is true. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so then they could cut us off at the knees across the board. <laughs> And and I've I've been thinking about that just recently. As someone else engaged me in this idea of, 
if we just had more money, then we could address these multiple issues more readily. And I, I asked them, and we, we never got to a, a terminus, but I said, is, is money really the solution? I mean, if you just had more, you think that you could like cancel out hunger or are the systems more complex than that? You know, I mean, yeah. it, it, obviously you, you can, you can have the money, but, but do you have the person who's willing to do it? Uh, you know, who's willing to fill John, those billions of rice bowls. Yeah. You've well, gone into a whole nother tangent uh, of discussion that actually yeah. would be a worthy episode to talk about yeah. because there's a whole human problem in there. There is, yeah. it, it, it's just not a, a lack yeah. of in the world. Yeah. There's also, there's actual true evil. There's corruption. Yeah. There's wickedness. Yeah. There's, there are, are, are sure. things that are negative forces that actually are pursued. Um, there, so it's not just a matter of a lack of something. Um, yeah. And we, we don't have to go down the rabbit hole, but that's, yeah. that's just a, th- that's a counterpoint to that. Like, well, all of it's wasted. I was like, you know, it, people are paid, you know, people make their lives for science. Um, and I think that pleases God that his creation is further explored and people make a livelihood and, 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 you know, make money that allows them to feed their children and, and invest in the future, whatever it is, whatever it is, this is good. Uh, it's, it's not like it's all wasted. Like they literally just shoot money into the atmosphere. <laughs> It's not like well, that. You we know do what? that too. Yeah. But, no, uh, well, that, that's true. That, uh, and also, also, and most importantly, I just saw Avengers: Infinity War. You know what? There's nothing good out there. So let you know. Let's, let's, not, go, let's yeah. not go. Let's not go. We need to build up our defense department, <laughs> right? <laughs> they know is waiting. The aliens just are always here. mean. Let's not go too far. Although I, I must say, you know, the New Horizons business in 2016, 2017, finally seeing Pluto close up, relatively speaking, unbelievable. Uh, I mean, just because the remember the even the Hubble. The best pictures it could, it could get were like five or six pixels. You know, that's the best it could do. Hubble, you know, of the the grand telescope mm-hmm. that it is. And then New Horizons just beep, did a drive by, like what, like ten thousand miles away, and took all these pictures, and it's unbelievable. So that that kind of business is wonderfully exciting. Simply to to look out into that that vastness and to get a better look at our our cosmological community. Now, what about some of the, these other discussions beyond beyond the finance? So you guys had a bunch of other wonderful things before we we bored well, everybody in the first seven minutes. Well, I I mean I definitely want to talk about aliens, yeah, uh, extraterrestrial life, and then maybe ask some of those theological questions that you hear brandished against Christianity. That if if there was, you know, uh, intelligent life, um, that it would totally dissolve away. The tenets of Christianity, uh, or of of even of theism, uh, but oh, well, I, I think you you had a nice point there. I do think there is a glory that's given to God as we explore His creation, as we admire the paint painting, we admire the artist, you know. And so the more we delve into it, and when we look at you know all of creation is somehow a reflection of its creator, and so this ever expansive universe that is just continuously expanding and changing. That somehow reflects the dynamism of God, this, this awesome being that could never be fully expressed by a material thing. And I think the universe does a beautiful job of that in all its intricacies and, and beauty and expansiveness. It's a way that it reflects the awesomeness of God. I mean, that's and that's very biblical, of course. I mean, when you read, especially like in the Psalms, that, that ancient people, the stars— and the night sky were a big part of their life. We've lost well, that in our in our well, modern yeah. cities with light pollution, and where we're under a roof, you know, from the time the yeah. sun goes down to the time it comes. We we have to be intentional to go outside and try to look up at the stars. And in our modern time, that if we're not careful, like John, I agree with you a hundred percent, and we see it that way through the lens of our faith. And I don't. I'm. I want to be careful not to paint the whole scientific community with this brush because I know there are a lot of exceptions out there. But also often you hear the people who are making these discoveries don't view it that way. It's kind of like, oh, well, I've been able to harness this and discover it now. So now this is like my thing. I own this. Because you know? I can explain it. Therefore, it doesn't need to have a cause. However, right. you know, when the Pope, the the Pope, spoke to the the people on the international space station and uh, 
a number of them all real seem to have a high reverence for fit for there's like they call it the god perspective or the overview perspective you know that these people that have been in space looking down at earth they have this this awakening in them that they're kind of looking at a creation in the way in which god sees it and mm. there's this peace that's there and and that seems to be um both uh francis and benedict has have talked to astronauts in space and while they were in space, which is really cool, uh, conversations with the heavens there, uh, long distance phone calls. But you know, th- those <laughs> astronauts that spoke with the Pope had a great reverence for the the theological, not theological, the philosophical meaning, averging on theological meaning of their experience. And of course, that's what he asked them about was yeah, with those yeah. kind of things. But they were able to respond with a heart of faith and not just as a mechanical kind of response. They they were able to see meaning beyond the mechanics and it, oh, okay. which was a very cool thing in that those interviews something to check out if you haven't uh you can you can hear the interviews uh or the not the interview but the discussion the pope had the phone calls he had with the international space station mm, that's cool. cool yeah but well yeah eric so you want to bounce back to aliens like you told us there are yeah, nothing we've, nothing good we've all there. seen ancient aliens and we, you've seen the cable or the Come on, you've seen it, and so we've all we've all cut the cord, man. Come on. All right, so so the, the, there's ancient aliens, and of course the Bible is really telling us about aliens. So let's go ahead. It's very biblical, you know. All the lights in the skies and the angelic beings are really aliens. So different ships, the cherubim, saucers. There, that sounds great. I mean, there have been a lot of awesome movies that the whole premise is, you know, alien life, right? Yeah, Eric, we were talking before the call. What? contact you said you watched a million oh, yeah. times yeah but i don't know why something got in me and i watched it every night for two weeks and i i i wouldn't uh i wouldn't say i agree with carl sagan point for point but you know that one line of his i mean everyone uses that you know if it's just us wouldn't that be such a waste of space um or yeah. something along those lines you know well the, the, yeah the, the, we respond no but you know at the same time, it's okay to say yes. The, the space is not wasted, first of all. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, and there's a whole lot out there, even though there's a lot of space in between. Now, I, it has it is, it is come to my understanding that we need the space in between. That's what uh, people smarter than me say. I don't know about that. But uh, the space itself as it is, the universe, not wasted. Yeah. Do I want to have this knowledge that there is something else? Yes. But... I have been forged in uh, in the you know in the heat of Lucas and Roddenberry and uh, all of these uh, dreamers who have painted pictures for me my whole life long of a universe that is complex and diverse, good guys, bad guys, low tech, high tech, high fantasy, low fantasy, and so of. We, I mean, I think we all dream of that a little bit. I don't know that anyone. I don't know of anyone who hates the idea of there being aliens. <laughs> you oh, know, there are is people. is like is like oh, we're really? so resentful of it. But maybe they're out there. No, I've never met any someone. Yeah, the someone church who, is very open to the possibility that there could be life out there. There's no theological issue with there being life out there. Ben, you were saying you you know people that hate the idea of aliens. Oh yeah, a lot of. And I, this term might mean different things to different people. So forgive me if it confuses somebody, but a lot of fundamentalist uh, oh, okay. Bible Christians, the idea of aliens is just as offensive as the idea of dinosaurs. Uh, that it somehow... <laughs> the dinosaurs were aliens. <laughs> that uh, it somehow jeopardizes the sovereignty of God or or the, even the reality of God. Um but of course, you can't dismiss something, even if it did jeopardize that. You can't dismiss it just because it jeopardizes it. You have to, you have to counter it with a, a logical argument of why it's not the case. You know. Well, mm-hmm. so let's dive into that. You, you know, I, I spend a little time thinking about this. I, I find it curious that it really would even be a question: Does that diversity of species on Earth jeopardize the singularity of the human? experience and its relationship with God. Does the, the, I mean, in the depths of the ocean, I mean, all this life that we, we never knew was there until just within the last 50 years, does that life in this foreign remote place where no human being is ever likely to, to tread, does that somehow jeopardize it? 
Of course not. It, it, it just shows that awesomeness, that expansiveness, how God's love just is so unfolding in creation. And so if we were to find life, whether it be complex or simple, all it shows is the grand architect has a beautiful vision that's bigger than what we can imagine. And and every time we go out into the rainforest or into the seas, we seem to discover that the it is more complex than we could have possibly imagined. Hmm. Uh, so So the idea that there couldn't be any other life it's just silly. Of course, there could be other life. There may not be other life. But yeah. Of course, there could be. To try to address a point from each of you at the same time here. So, yeah, John, what you just said, there absolutely could be. And that's not in contention with our beliefs at all. But Eric, back to what you said a minute ago about the waste of space. Like you said, it, it's not a waste of space because from our viewpoint, all of that could just be further part of the gift from God to us, his creation. And the waste yeah. of space thing has a utilitarian mindset to it. Like it, absolutely, everything has <laughs> yeah. to have a purpose as I define purpose. But I, I was, me and Eric were talking about it. And well said. If, if I'm God, first of all, even the universe doesn't seem humongous to me like it does to us you know of course so what we define as this limitless space he can actually take all that in <laughs> you know unlike us so yeah that that idea of waste of space it, it's really a, a matter of perspective i think but and then bouncing back to you john and the why would anybody find it disproving a, of god mm -hmm. i think if you were a a person who wanted to be antagonistic to the idea of God or especially Christianity. And you discovered that there was, I think that the hinge here and Eric, you might have something to add on this, but the hinge is on intelligent life. So we can, people can make peace with all these different species on earth and all of that, because we still remain the crown of creation, the top of the food chain. But then all of a sudden, if we have to contend with this idea that there are beings that who knows, or could be actually smarter than us. That's how all the movies portray it most of the time. You know, they're more intelligent and more advanced than we are. Then it kind of shakes our our comfort of, well, are we still the crown of creation? And if you are that antagonistic scientist who wants to disprove Christianity, then you, it's kind of like an in-your-face moment of like, huh, see, you're, well, not, you're not so special that, anymore. <laughs> that, that, that provides no challenge for me, though, because I already definitively believe that there are beings that are greater than me, some of them fallen, some of them not fallen, that have a significantly greater intelligence than I, um, and, and, or greater than I'll ever achieve. And, and I mean, we believe in angelic beings, um, yeah. you know, the angels and, and those angels that fall, that, that were fallen, the demons. There are beings that are, are beyond our world already, uh, and that in no way... They are, they are of all those things, higher intelligence. They are of greater glory. They are of greater luminescence uh, th than I. Oh, yeah. And, I uh, agree completely. The only reason in which I could even have a grounds to stand on is because the incarnation. So not because of my greatness by my human nature, but because the divine became human. Um, and so then we dive into even things like salvation. Would aliens need salvation? Well, it would be depend if they were a fallen race. And are they capable of salvation? Here, let's once again refer to our angelic, uh, I don't know if we call them cousins or siblings or what, <laughs> but our angelic uh, other creatures, there, there is no salvation for the angels. Th those angels that did not fall are not in need of salvation. They never turn from grace. Those angels that had their full w knowledge and free will and chose evil, chose they have chosen condemnation. And there is no salvation for them either because they had all that was necessary for them at that moment of choice. So an alien being would fall in the same category. If it is a fallen being, a being that free used its free will to reject God, then salvation may be necessary for it, but it may not be possible dependent upon the way in which its relationship is with God. Hmm. Yeah, Eric, what were you saying earlier about Pope Francis's comment? on Martians. It it ties right. in with that, doesn't it? it? it uh, somewhat. Um, I think it I think it 
begs a different point that John isn't addressing, but he, he said if Martians, I mean, he's just referring to aliens in mm-hmm. general, if they showed up and if they had green skin and long noses and big ears, <laughs> like the, he said, like the children paint them, um, if they uh, ap- arrived, if they appeared on our planet, then we would open our doors to them. Um, and, uh, and then the, the, uh, Vatican, um, uh, astrophysicist whatever whatever he is father guy then he later he later said that um that this of course is you know if if they have a soul then of course they would be they would be admitted to baptism in in the pre-show i think ben what you said was interesting not not a point that i had really considered but i think a very reasonable point of contention is that if we are made in god's image from the earth as creation and then if the martians appeared uh, then were they too made in God's image? Uh, and and how can we uh, work that out? Because obviously they're not well, like but us. That, you know? But that's that uh, we have here. We have male and female. Both are created in the image and likeness of God, but incredibly diverse. Um, right. And, and so the image of God, image and likeness of God, cannot fully be expressed in any material being. So. There could be multiple right. races that are, are in the image and likeness of God, each yeah. reflecting the glory of God in a different way, just as man and woman, who are radically different, both equally reflect that image. And so there, there's no ability for them not. I, I find it curious, the idea, though, um, part of salvation, though, is Christ assumes a human will, a human intellect, a human body, a human soul, and that's how they are redeemed. That's how we are redeemed. If it was not assumed it mm-hmm. was not healed, and we were not redeemed. So I, I find it odd, the idea of offering baptism into Christ, the incarnation into a human person for a, another species, because the incarnation precisely into humanity is about the salvation of humanity. Would there maybe not have to be an Asland or a, a different incarnation of Christ into other species if they were to need I don't know that that actually would be possible through yeah, the the easiest solution is that all all life in the universe and all universes is humanoid. <laughs> you know that that God has has begotten and created humans across the starways. Yeah, but they would but have we, to we be do, descendants yeah. of Adam and Eve for them to have uh, con- to contract in a sense original sin the need for salvation is because the privation that we are we gain through Mm -hmm. the privation that we have not gain the privation that we have from the condition which we're born as heirs of adam and eve we have an old with the old head of humanity and now we have the new head in christ so Mm -hmm. a humanoid would not necessarily mean fallen humanoid sure sure Mm. so 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 you so by that logic you would not say that the atoning work of Jesus extends beyond, beyond the people of this of this coil. No, I would not say that. Uh, yeah. What I would say is, I don't know that we can necessarily say that. What revelation and God would reveal to us? What? It, yeah, yeah. What comes because, out of the clouds? Because it, it, <laughs> sure, it may, yeah. of, of course, the salvific work of Jesus Christ is enough for all of the universe, a million times over. But the way in which we understand the incarnation. And the salvation that comes through that, it does seem to be uh, precisely two humans. It's a human intellect, a human will, a human soul, a human body that the divine incorporates into him and becomes one of us and dies on our behalf. So it does seem odd to me, but is it possible that that is that it, it, it wouldn't be because there's a lack in the salvation of Christ or the work of Christ or the grace that Christ gains? There's no lack there. But is it applicable to a race that is not burdened with the the fall or the fall from Adam and Eve? These are some big ideas. Yeah. I'm trying to wrap my head around it. So C.S. Lewis, I mean, he's by no means infallible, not a saint, but I, I personally feel one of the smartest writers on Christianity that have ever existed. He, I know he said, and I couldn't find where this quote was from, I just remember reading it. So this is the worst kind of quote to cite. But he had said once in in addressing why alien life forms 
pose no challenge to Christianity. He said, Christianity is the story of how God has dealt with our race on this planet. There's nothing to say that there aren't different stories of how God has dealt with different races on other planets. Now, I don't know how that will check out, you know, put through the put through the litmus test of Catholic doctrine and every belief and every thought. But that little that little first part, it seems to cover quite a bit of, of ground in a, in a good way, of, you know, that this Christianity is the story is our and, story. And I think that's kind of what I'm saying in there. And I think that 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 statement yeah. there is is a summation kind of it. I mean, I mean, when we look at theology, a body or, or any of those things, it is precisely through that incarnation in the, um, the assumption of humanity that co- that is a, a intricate part. It has to be man has sinned. It has to be God become man that does the work of salvation. Or it doesn't have to be, but that's the way God chose to do it. Yeah, it's a it's a really fun question on the to pose it on the negative end. It's a can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> sure. uh, because like already my brains, I've thought of probably five different things that I'm not even going to say because it <laughs> just takes us so many directions yeah. of, of weirdness. Sure. But sure. both of you had ideas that I've never even thought of. Eric, I've never, cons- never even once considered what if the other life forms were in fact very human-like. You know, because I guess I've been so indoctrinated by the movies and sci-fi. Like, it's never even crossed my mind. Like, what if they look just like us? You know, they're different in yeah. some way, but what if they look just like us? Yeah, and then, uh, sure. and then John, you said, you brought up, you know, it, the real question would be what, whether or not it was a fallen race. Uh, and that thought had never crossed my mind and thinking of other life forms. And, and it is, it is possible that God does have humans on another place that are unfallen. That would be really yeah. wild. To, to think that just so so far away that I mean, we we can't even know they exist that there's another planet of I mean it, even if they live their lives just like us you know I mean it, needing the same and this is where I'm out of my league of I suppose that based on proximity to the sun and all of that it, it would be an impossibility but if there was another earth like planet you know, so similar to ours that they eat similar food, you know, all that. And I, and I, like I said, I'm supposing that's a impossibility, but we also probably don't know what's possible. You know, I, I hear a lot. I just hear the phrase. It's a mathematical impossibility that there isn't life. Now I don't, I mean, I am not a mathematician. You don't want to start or end math with me, but I hear that a lot. I've not heard it justified. But I, I hear that a lot. And so I'll go with the crowd. You know, uh, I would like to know more if someone could explain it to me like I was a two-year-old. You know, but if, I mean, what is that equation exactly? Where yeah, I've heard does that, that come too, from? I, I don't know the yeah. numbers either, Eric, but I've heard that, that same thing that if we look at the, the vastness of space, the number of stars, and if only 0.1% or something of planets had, or galaxies had the right kind of star and those Goldilocks planets and things like that. It's still the number it is astronomical. The number of planets that should have life because the incredible vastness of the universe. So just, just because there's so much possibility there is, that is the, the mathematically that is probable. Um, however, there is the problem of where are they? Because we're not the oldest galaxy in the universe uh, we're not the oldest solar system in our galaxy that the number that there should be there should be um species that have obtained interstellar abilities the ability to, right. to, to go and where are they that is that is a, uh, a problem for that mathematical equation is there should have, there are should be species that are eons older than us and more technologically advanced and able to reach us I've, I've, I mean, the, the theories about highly advanced civilizations building Dyson spheres around their sun for unlimited perpetual energy, you know, so that's why we can't see the suns because they're gone, or the, the stars rather, because they're gone. I mean, they've literally encased them in, in that what we, uh, you know, have the theory of the Dyson sphere. And there's some other, there's some other principle, or is it called a principle or is it a formula that 
that even if there was, you know, life and it was proven by that mathematical formula that I don't know the details of, that even if this was true, that the likelihood of them, just John, what you said, A, finding us and B, uh, taking any interest in us whatsoever to actually make contact was so super duper small that we could have already been under the gaze of many other telescopes or microscopes. Um, but, uh, but because of our, of our, you know, primitive <laughs> lifestyle, um, maybe we've already been passed by. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a marvelous thought experiment. Yeah. We have to develop warp core technology before they're willing to call us. <laughs> well, I've seen that movie. I love that. I love that movie. <laughs> and I'll throw this out there. I'm, I don't mean to disparage because the, the people who have said that, Eric, you know, about it's a mathematical impossibility that there isn't more life out there. I don't, I don't know who these people are. I don't know anything about them. So not to disparage, but just my radar, when you've been an atheist, you never quite forget that mindset. And to me, when I hear that, what I actually hear is a possible explanation for people who feel that way is believing that there's more life out there lines up with your atheism a lot more than we're not we shouldn't be here you know us planet earth the minute possibility of everything that coalesced to make this happen yeah that doesn't fit with the atheist worldview and it bothers them every single day of how did this happen and why did it happen but if you can say well, mathematically and scientifically... It happened elsewhere. It makes it less special. Right. It's, then we are less special. Exactly. And then we are not the crown of creation. And it, it makes it a lot easier to not believe there is a creator behind it all. But if, mm -hmm. man, if at the end of the day it turns out that all those planets and stars and all that space is just one more piece of the love story that God has just for us... Well, that's that's hard to swallow, you know, if you don't believe there is a God. So, and again, that's my my kind of a former atheist radar going yeah. off. That the people who say that yeah. that might not be their motivation at all. <laughs> but I, I think there's a beauty in in being able to to hold both ideas. If there is life oh, yeah. out there, it, it shows it shows an awesomeness and expansiveness of God's creation. And mm -hmm. if there isn't life out there it shows us something about our dignity. You know, it, mm -hmm. it shows us something about the singularity of the human species that God created. A and both are awe inspiring and beautiful ideas. Yeah. It's a, it's a life crushing idea and, and the pressure is around you from all sides, like being in space or underwater that uh, no matter which way you perceive it. I remember being a boy and learning about, the ever expanding universe and and I don't think I cried but I think I was afraid of this idea because of course there's no way for you, our minds to really perceive it yeah because all we can do is draw a box then a bigger box then a bigger box mm -hmm. then a bigger box but in circles. fact there there is no box or circle there there, yeah. there, there is no def, def, there is no boundary you know it's it's just, if there is it's you cannot that you can't zoom out far enough. Do you know what I mean? Or if you're at your maximum zoom, the the universe always just goes a little bit further. And I don't know what it was that terrified me about this as a young man, but uh, but this idea that you know this is how big it is, and and not even knowing to scale how small I was. Yeah. But this concept of this truly ever expanding, marvelous place universe. Um, I I I don't know how I'm going to convince her of these things. Hannah loves the moon, and uh, whenever we're out and the moon pops up, the moon and you know all this kind of stuff. I I hope that that my kids they don't have to be astrophysicists or or anything like that. But I hope that they love the sky and the stars yeah. and the sea. That that this episode wouldn't have been as good talking about the ocean. But you know what do they say that that we have charted less of the ocean than of our of the, the visible the sky? Of, yeah. Come on! I mean, now that there's so much down there, okay, Bermuda Triangle, Nessie, what else? Uh, who cares? Maybe Not, Bigfoot's uh, got a you know an underwater an underwater there. base. Yeah, absolutely. Olympus? No, what's the other one? The one underwater? Atlantis. Um, Atlantis. Atlantis. There you go. <laughs> Olympus is not underwater. Okay. Uh, well. This was, uh, you, you guys talked about science before. Yeah. Didn't you? Yeah. Is this our, this our second or third episode talking about science, right? Something like that. 
I can't remember. It, I mean, definitely it's, second. I don't know if we really talked about science. We, we, we <laughs> it was a good episode. The edge of it. We we maybe it, put a no. dent in it. Science's car, but that's okay. Well, John, do you have any uh, listener mail? Did you get any text messages or anything? No, I I don't. I'm okay. sorry. That's quite all right. Just wanted to make sure I didn't want to miss it. Oh, uh, so, uh, Ben, did I win? Did I win you over to NASA a little bit more? Did I can can I, can I get you to come a little closer? <laughs> a little, a little bit more. I think something that that I was just reminded of recently it. was that uh, the in the Apollo missions, the computing power of the the computer, yeah. you know, the whole system was even then weaker than a TI eighty hmm. graphing calculator. So the the power that you have, even you, Ben, in your flip phone. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> or whatever whatever steam powered cell phone you're using right now, you know, uh is I mean, this the technology is on our side to try again, you know, if uh if we could get that support. It, it very exciting. Um I, we didn't even get into SETI, which I know is a whole different that's where contact comes in, right? Uh that's a whole nother thing. But we did certainly talk about that pursuit. So thank you. Uh this has been the Catholic Forge, and we'd like to close, as always with a prayer and a blessing. May God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit bless you, guard you, and lead you to eternal life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to The Catholic Forge. We hope you've enjoyed this episode and will leave us a positive rating and review wherever you listen. How about five stars for the chance that there is life out there? And for that uh, touching song from the, is it from the 80s, Ben? That reminds us that God is watching us from a distance. You can help out the show in a big way by uh, forgetting about that part (laughs) and by sharing it with your friends and your family. Yeah, I don't know. I was just hoping that you uh, you would rework our theme song for this episode to uh, David Bowie's oh. Space Odyssey <laughs> with some different lyrics. <laughs> oh, uh, 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 don't you put me on the spot now? I'm too embarrassed. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> Three, as always, two, <laughs> one, go. <laughs> as always, you can continue the conversation with us on Facebook and Twitter. Let us know what the math is for this formula that everyone's talking about. Is it really a thing? I don't know. You to get a hold of us, you can reach us at thecatholicforge at gmail.com. For more information regarding the podcast, visit our website at www.thecatholicforge.com. We especially thank our stellar, our interstellar wives for their, you see what I did there, for their support of this. Have you ever seen that movie, Interstellar? you seen that one? Not yet. I hear Your it's great. Wife is interstellar. What species is she? <laughs> the movie. Have you seen that movie, John? Interstellar? It was not great. Some major uh, potholes. Oh well, it's a big mess, but it's marvelous. Yeah, uh, check that out. You, got, everyone listening, has a lot of homework to do. <laughs> you got to go read spinoff from NASA. All these movies to watch. We'll put it in the description. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> watch Star Wars. No, watch Star Trek for an optimistic view of the future. <laughs> no one wants to think of a future with the Empire. No one wants that. You're right, you're right. Let's look at a godless universe. I'd, I'd much rather... No, there are god beings all over Star Trek. We have the Q in the continuum. There's, there's a profound sense of, of deism. But you, you prefer... I know you prefer the more accessible Eastern mysticism of Star, Star Wars with its yin and its yang. I'm hanging up now. 